Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez, and today is a great Saturday here in the Twin Cities area. Uh, thank you for coming back to our show. We want to thank all the fans out there who continue to tune in every Saturday at 4 o'clock on SCC Television Studios here in White Bear Lake. A reminder that we also replay the show on our YouTube channel, which is Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, we have a great show today. I have a very special guest, uh, Michelle Mankey, and she's going to be making a, a big announcement here. So I'd like to welcome for the first time, Michelle. Thank you, Tony. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. You look lovely today. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us, what's your big announcement? The big announcement is a week and a half ago, I filed um, at the Campaign Finance Board uh, as a candidate for the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, specifically in the House District 42B. Wow, and uh, I think we have a picture of you actually at the <laughs> Campaign Finance Board, if uh, Dallas can put that up there. Uh, so you filed, what was it, last week then? A uh, week ago this past Thursday. So there you are right there. And what, what sort of feelings are, are you going through at this point? Are you nervous, excited, uh, ready for ready to, to take it to the streets or what? Actually, that photo was taken after I had actually filed, so there was a little more relief there. But going into it, I was a little nervous. Mm -hmm. So are you from uh, this area? I am originally born and raised uh, from northern uh, Roseville. I graduated from Alexander Ramsey High School, which today is the Roseville Area High School. Small business owner, um, also graduated from Century College, uh, and degree in uh, visual communications. Nice. Well, it sounds like you, you have a lot of connections uh, to the local community, to your district. Can you tell us a little more about the geography of the district, what number it is, and the cities that is included? Uh, 42B is um, Vadnais Heights, Little Canada, Gem Lake, uh, Northern Roseville, and Southern Shoreview. Great, great. Well, running for public office is a pretty big deal. It's it is. pretty big commitment, and you have to have some type of a, a burning desire or passion or something. What, what is it that, that's driving you? Why are you running, Michelle? Well, primarily, I want to represent the true voice of the citizens and the businesses within my district. You know, we need people at the Capitol who know and understand the concerns and the values of our families, our children, um, our businesses, and our seniors. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person that you're running against, uh, th is he or she from the district? No, I believe um, he is from the uh, Iron Range. Oh, okay. So uh, I saw that uh, there was an article in the Roseville patch, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little longer than a year ago. Uh, can you uh, explain a little more about what that article was? Because you have a pretty special connection to the Minnesota State Capitol. I do, I do. I'm very proud of it as well. Um, the article that you probably saw a year ago would have been just marking um, a couple days before I actually climbed to the top of the Capitol. Wow, I think we have a picture of that too. Um, actually climbed to the top of the Capitol, and what you're seeing there is um, the exterior scaffolding that I climbed up. Um, and then emerging, the, the second arrow there is showing where I emerged. Um, that is called the lantern. And about two years ago, workers um, that were uh, doing the renovation mm -hmm. on the Capitol Dome mm -hmm. and the lantern found a small clamp. And the clamp had a name and a date engraved in it. And the workers you know, automatically took it over to people who were doing some research and putting a documentary together on who built our capital. Mm -hmm. And they were able to trace the information back to my family. Uh, the name on it was O.C. Mankey, which is my great-grandfather. And the date was August 10th, 1902. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty incredible connection. Did you know about this, or were you made aware of it? I didn't really know that my great-grandfather had worked on the Capitol. I did know that he had worked on the cathedral. So this was really new information for me. And, it, you know, it was exciting, and we found out a lot of information that, you know, just wouldn't have, you know, ever come out, I think. That's, uh, that's really, really interesting. And, uh, you know, I look forward to observing the, the progress of your campaign. I know that you're, you're fresh out of the gates here. Yep. 
Is this about uh, what you want, or is it about what the people in your district want? It is really about the about what the people in my district want. You know, over the next couple months, and actually throughout the campaign, you know, I will actually be focusing on. It, and mostly listening to what the people of the district, um, you know, what their concerns are um, and what their values are and, bring, and wanting to bring those forth to the House. Excellent. Well, can you tell uh, the audience a little more about how they can find out more about you, your campaign, if they want to help out in any way? Uh, my website is mankeyforhouse.com. And we are up on Twitter and Facebook, so please just log in and, and find out more information and certainly donate to the campaign. Menke for House. I uh, encourage you all to go to the website, check out Michelle Menke, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Tony. Hope you can come again. Thank you. So that was Michelle Mankey talking about her uh, exciting announcement, her campaign. We thank her for making that announcement here. And we're going to bring on Sam Wayne Pierce, who's a regular uh, contributor to the show. But before we do that, we're going to check in with Charlie Kosnick, the Cos Report. Uh, as you know, he makes uh, broadcasts out of Los Angeles, California, one of the few conservative Republicans in Hollywood. And uh, we're going to line up his video and uh, get that played right now. Here we go again, here we go again, here we go again. I demand more. I need it and I'm gonna have it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Cos Report. I am your host, Charlie Kosnick. The Navy Yard shooting last week was a real tragedy and is a serious subject. But some of the circumstances of this horrific event bordered on absurdity, so we have to comment. When this event happened, the media heard from their sources that an AR-15 was in fact used. Since this is such a controversial weapon and controversy spells ratings, the media could not wait to make this the focal point of their reporting. We believe in AR-15. Are you aware of that weapon? Yes, I am. It's, um, it's a very commonly used rifle in America. It was still infiltrated by a man with a legally purchased AR-15. Because it? I'm telling you a fact, Ben, he bought it legally in Virginia. Then the actual people in charge of the investigation came out and said this. At this time, we believe that Mr. Alexis entered building 197 at the Navy Yard with a shotgun. Wait, huh, I'm so confused. What, what was that you were telling me, Piers, about him buying and using an AR-15? Why was I supposed to listen to you on this? Because I'm telling you a fact. Oh, that's right. You were telling me a fact. That turned out to be completely not true. He's in last place in the ratings, right? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, we now know that the gunman bought and used a shotgun, not an AR-15. I wonder where he would get the idea to do that. You don't need an AR-15. It's harder to aim, it's harder to use, and in fact, you don't need 30 rounds. Buy a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. That man has one heartbeat away from being the leader of the free world. One heartbeat. Look, once the weapon of information was figured out, things got even more absurd. See, it turns out that this Aaron Alexis had Navy security clearance, even though he had been arrested before on gun charges. He was arrested in Seattle in 2004 for shooting out another man's tires. He was then arrested again in Texas in 2010 for firing a weapon into the ceiling of his Texas apartment. Yeah, but let's cut the Navy a break. Those charges were dropped, so how are they going to know that this guy might be a problem? I mean, it's not like he's going to just pick up the phone and tell him he's crazy. Just over six weeks ago, a naval base in Newport, Rhode Island, was contacted by local police who warned them that one of their contractors, Aaron Alexis, was behaving strangely. Alexis called police to his hotel. Alexis told police he had not seen the people, but he believed that there were two men and a woman and that they were, quote, using a microwave machine to send vibrations through the ceiling, penetrating his body so he could not sleep. Oh, no, he actually did that. Wow. 
So let me get this straight. A man, not honorably, but generally discharged from the Navy, who has two prior gun arrests and actually tells the police he's controlled by microwaves, gets security clearance. Who does the Navy's background checks? The company is hired by the government, so they have to be reputable. The firm that checked the background of Washington Navy Yard gunman Aaron Alexis faces new scrutiny this morning. That's because USIS also vetted NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Sleep well, America. Sleep well. But hey, that's just me. Make sure you go check us out at thecausereport.com. Don't forget to share this video with friends. Share it on Twitter. Or like us on Facebook. That's it for today. We will see you next time on The Cause Report. Stopping this one! Whee! That's uh, Charlie Kosnick. He's a friend and colleague broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. And I'm starting to really look forward to the Cos Report week in and week out because he really has a pretty good ability to hone in on some of these issues and bring to light uh, controversies and conflicts that uh, very few people do in, in the mainstream media. And uh, with that, I'm going to bring on a good friend and our contributor, Sam Wayne Pierce. Uh, Sam, can you hear us? Hello, Minnesota. Hello, New York. Wait, so Tony, does that mean we're not the mainstream media? We are alternative media, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I, 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 just, I just wondered if that meant if, if we were excluded from the mainstream media. <laughs> I think for now we are excluded, but, you know, hopefully one day we will be uh, mainstream. But Sam, we had Michelle Menke on earlier she made her big announcement for running for the minnesota state house of representatives and it was great to have her on and you actually have uh, an announcement as well so sam just let the audience know uh, your big news well tony i won't be running for office anytime <laughs> soon but uh, a few weeks ago following my last appearance on the tony hernandez show uh, i did rush out of uh, my home studio to get engaged so uh, wow. I'll be getting married, Tony. Wow. I, uh, I I held off for as long as possible as a single guy, but eventually, as you know, I guess it catches up with all of us. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to meet Claire yet, but from everything that you've told me in the past and what I've heard about her and just to see how happy that you are with her, I just know that you made a, a great decision. She sounds like a great gal and I uh, wish you guys the best in wedding planning and all of that, because let me tell you, wedding planning is a ton of fun for guys. Are you finding that one out? Uh, fun's not the adjective <laughs> that comes to mind for me, but I, but I will share a quick story about Claire and the, my fiancé and the Tony Hernandez show. Tony, uh, when you first asked me to come on the show uh, almost a year ago to talk, I guess it was, yeah, almost a year ago, to talk about or March... February maybe to talk mm -hmm. about college basketball and Claire is a big basketball fan so she drew up these big posters with stats and rankings and facts and trivia and she held she held them up for me behind the computer and the Skype camera so that my first time on the air with you I wouldn't stumble <laughs> too much and did an excellent job I couldn't have made my first appearance on the show without her so it, it must be a match made in heaven. Nice. And it, would you consider her to be uh, the number one fan of the show? Is she a fan of this uh, particular show, Sam? Uh, she is, but her, her parents, my future in-laws, they, they watch every show. Uh, we, you, you, have a, you have a growing audience in, in upstate New York, Tony, so that's the good news. That is good. So just briefly, we want to hear about how you did the proposal. Uh, it was, was it last weekend or, or, or two Two weeks ago now? Yeah, yeah. and uh, what I did was I got uh, dressed up a little bit by my standards for the show, <laughs> got my suit on, and you made a comment about it on the air, and I kind of skirted the topic and just said, well, I always dress up for the show, even though uh, regular viewers know that's probably not the case. But uh, we had to get out of here in a hurry because we had my grandparents' 60th uh, anniversary wedding, 60th anniversary party for their uh, wedding anniversary. So we had to get out of here, head down there. It was about a 45-minute drive away. We got to the party a little bit late, but all of my family was there. And then uh, I was in a nice club, and we took a walk out on the golf course that night, and I, and I did it there. And then that way, when we went back inside, uh, the whole family was there to share the moment. And was everybody uh, excited for you? 
excited, surprised, um, happy, very, very, uh, very joyous occasion, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it was, I'm very close with my grandparents and that was their 60th wedding anniversary party. And Tony, I know you are very close to your family. Uh, you and Leona both. And, you know, it's, it's, it's special to share that kind of thing with your family. So you were on the golf course. Was it on the putting green? Was it on the, the, the fairway? Uh, were you in the rough, the sand trap? Where were you? Fairway. We, we just took a, a nice walk down the cart path and, and got probably several holes out away from where the, the main building was uh, at, the, at the country club and, and did it right there. That's beautiful. And did you get on one, on one knee? Oh, I did, Tony. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I, <laughs> I'm not a real <laughs> traditional conservative, but when it comes to things like getting your bride to be's parents' permission and one knee and, and doing that sort of thing the right way, I, I went pretty much by the book. So are you, are you actually saying that you're a conservative now, Sam? Because I've, I've always no, you know, given mixed no, messages. No, you, you know, you I, say you're liberal and then it's libertarian. Now it's conservative. Which one is it? I, uh... Well, Tony, the great thing about identifying yourself as a libertarian is then you can choose uh, what's important to you and where you want to adhere to traditional values, but you don't judge people that may have other values, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're more of an independent uh, type. So what, what did you think about uh, the candidate who was on here earlier, Michelle Mankey? She's pretty impressive. I think so, Tony, and I've only uh, just started following her on Twitter. But, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to see her make the appearance on your show and, and obviously wish her the best of luck. And uh, just, like, just like I do now with uh, Representative Mary Franson, who I, who I follow on Twitter and Facebook, and, you know, guests on the show, uh, I certainly keep up with, with what they're doing and how their either time in office or their campaigns are going. So I'm excited. Yeah, she's, uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what's going to happen because there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about this happening in Minnesota. On October 1st, Obamacare goes into full effect or, or we'll see. Uh, we're going to talk about whether that's going to happen. Uh, but there's been October some... First, October 1st is in... What's that, Sam? 14. Uh, say that again. You kind of cut off a little bit. Um, October 1st is when enrollment begins for January 1st. Mm -hmm. So yep. it doesn't totally go into effect, but you can begin to enroll on the exchanges. Yeah, you're right about that. And th there's been a lot of controversy, though, with the rollout of Obamacare, or what we call it here in Minnesota, is MNSUR, M-N-SUR. And they got a lot of heat because there's a huge uh, privacy breach, a security breach, where I think it was one of the ex-employees of MNSUR uh, sent out around 1,500 or 1,600 uh, Minnesotans information, you know, social security number, health data, and other types of, of private data of these individuals. And it actually caused uh, quite a ruckus. And, and Minsher was quick to jump on it. They fired the employee. They said that it was a, a, an employee who was acting outside of their policies and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it kind of highlights uh, what can go on in terms of a, the abuse of privacy, because this person fired now, but had access to individuals private data and you know a lot of people are alarmed by that especially to another story that that came out and we talked about this last week was uh, representative Steve Dreskowski he actually brought it to light uh, but uh, people within the government have been uh, what they call pinging people and what that means is is they're looking at people's driving records private records and you know they're they're targeting or what the allegations are is they're targeting people who are involved politically. Uh, they're targeting the families of people who are involved politically. Uh, there was even a KSTP reporter. Uh, she actually was uh, pinged the most amount of times, I think something around 14 or 1500 times. Very attractive woman. Uh, you know, and you have to wonder, you know, what is going on behind the scenes with all these government bureaucrats that have access to this information. I, I'm concerned by it. You know, even the, the guy like Snowden, Edward Snowden, who's now living in Russia, like he talked about how, and he wasn't even, he was a contractor, but he talked about how he could go in and if, if they wanted to, and, and it wasn't their protocol and it wasn't what they were supposed to do, 
but he could go in and he could listen to people's phone conversations or he could tap into you know specific types of people and you know for the vast vast majority of people they, they really don't have to worry about it I don't think because you know I mean most people aren't important enough or maybe that's not the right word but they don't have no reason for people to go in and spy but if you're famous if you're out there if you're politically active uh, well, you better believe that you might get targeted if you or if you plan on becoming politically active now you have to now you have to worry about each and every last skeleton in the closet uh that could that could be out there um and then the people that are in power <laughs> can make sure that uh other people can't maybe run for an office if they have access to something that a 45-year-old did when they were 20. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's scary. And then, and then the other, a quick comment, Tony, that I wanted to make, uh, anytime you introduce this much technology, and there was a good article in Wall Street Journal about it this re week, that there are going to be a number of software glitches that impact not just MN Sure but all of the exchanges, because you're talking about all of these large government bureaucratic agencies and all of their various software components interacting. And viewers of the show may or may not know this. I actually work in software. I'm a software architect, mm -hmm. and I work with large enterprise applications. And th there's a reason <laughs> that people like me are employed, because, because of the complexities of lots of data. You hear about data in the cloud. Tony, mm -hmm. and uh, where where will all of our data that the government has on us be? What what kind of cloud and who has access and what applications can get access? And Edward Snowden uh, was very good at utilizing in, in software and in systems what we might call a backdoor, finding ways to get at data that uh, that you think doesn't that the d the designer of the system thinks doesn't exist, and then it does. Um, firewalls between large applications what kind of ports on those firewalls are open and how can data that's supposed to be kept at the IRS end up at Health and Human Services or the local um, MN Sure exchange. Um, there, there are going to be a lot of glitches and it's not just the human uh, element of someone that's out to get you and wants to dig up dirt on you in, in the system, but also the technical errors, the software glitches that could lead to these kind of um, breaches or, or loss of privacy. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And uh, Sam, we're going to uh, talk a little more because big debate and the big event from last week, of course, was Senator Ted Cruz. He gave a marathon speech. You can't really call it a filibuster because it wasn't exactly technically a filibuster, but for 21 hours, the man, the senator, stood on the U.S. Senate floor and gave a speech uh, educating the public, talking about the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, and his reasons and arguments and logic behind uh, defunding and dismantling it and basically preventing the implementation of the law. And I, I believe that we can have a, a pretty good discussion here uh, about the future of healthcare in America. You know, there's a lot of differing viewpoints. Uh, we can't ignore the polls that show uh, more and more Americans are becoming uh, frustrated and, and also against the idea of Obamacare, and they don't believe that it's actually going to accomplish what the designers or the architects of the bill uh, say that it is. But uh, before we get too far into that, I want to introduce it by uh, talking to or playing the clip from uh, Senator Ted Cruz. And uh, let's see if we can find it right here. Let's see it, Dallas, if you can line that up. And ultimately, every member of this body works for we the people. The reason there is such profound frustration in one, you know, across this country, the reason this body is held in such abysmally low esteem, is that for too long, Washington has not listened to the American people. So I simply want to note to the American people who have so engaged that this debate's in your hands. Ultimately, all 100 senators, all 46 Republicans, all 54 Democrats work for you. 
the pleas from the American people, I tell you, in Texas are deafening. The frustration that the United States Senate doesn't listen to the people is deafening. So I would call on all 46 Republicans to unite, to stand together and to vote against cloture on the bill on Friday or Saturday, because otherwise, if we vote with the majority leader and with the Senate Democrats, we will be voting to allow the majority leader to fund Obamacare on a straight party line vote, a 51 vote, partisan vote. And the American people will understand that. And voting to give that power to the majority leader, I would suggest, is not consistent with, I believe, the heartfelt commitment of all 46 members of this conference to oppose Obamacare. The only path, if we're going to oppose Obamacare, is to stand together and oppose cloture. So that's pretty, uh, that's Senator, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, uh, historic 21-hour speech, the U.S. Senate floor, and uh, made, he, he made quite a name for himself. Uh, there's people that agree with him, lots of people that agree with him. There's people within his own party that are saying his efforts are futile, and there's others that are saying that Ted Cruz is no different than any other politician, and he's just grandstanding and promoting himself and his cause and basically setting up his 2016 presidential election. So, Sam, I wanted to uh, talk to you about this. And, and the first question I wanted to pose to you is, are the efforts of Senator Cruz uh, from last week and, and prior to that, are they futile? I don't know if I would go as far as to say futile, Tony. That's a strong word. But he certainly, whether he meant to or not, kept all of the focus on himself and a fellow Republican and to an extent the, um, the debate within the GOP on how to, how, how to go about the Obamacare fight. And I think that if it were me, I would, I would want to put more of the pressure on the Democrats for them to own this and defend uh, the challenges that we're seeing right now. But by, but by talking for 21 hours and by, to a certain extent, going after the more moderate Republicans that aren't on board with his tactics, then it just becomes political theater and, I think, fodder to a certain extent within the GOP. We're not talking about the fact that the Democrats own this. Every single one voted for it. Not a single Republican did. And now we're not forcing them to defend it. Uh, and by we, I, I'm saying if I were, if I were Senator Cruz and, and anyone in the GOP, I would want to force them to defend it, to own it, to, to continue to sell it to the American people. And now the debate is about how the Republicans should fight it. I'm not sure that's constructive. That's a, uh, that's a pretty... Uh good point that you made there, Sam, and I think it's one that uh, we definitely need to listen to. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, one thing that I do want to point out, though, is, you know, you, you talked about he may be in it for himself and grandstanding for himself, and a lot of other people have made that same allegation, but one thing that I would say is that to do anything for 21 hours straight, whether it's give a speech, whether it's stand for 21 hours, whether it is to watch TV for 21 hours, to do anything for that amount of time takes an incredible amount of perseverance, commitment. You need to have some type of a, a burning passion inside you. I mean, there's, you can't even sleep for 21 hours. And I mean, wouldn't you agree that there has to be something inside of them that's driving him to do yes. this? I and mean, could you give a speech for 21 hours? Uh, I don't think so, but maybe. I mean, I, I have some pretty bad days at work. I think talking for 21 hours in the Senate, I, I might rather do than uh, three <laughs> days of a new software rollout. Yeah. Um, so, Tony, a, a, a quick clarification. I, I, did, I am not in the camp that says he did this all for himself and ulterior motives in a 2016 presidential run. I, I don't believe that. I think he's very principled, as are a lot of the Tea Party contingency or members, whatever, whatever we call those those people in Congress. So, and I I like that. My my question is now what? So you so you spoke for twenty one hours, 
But now what? What's the major... What, you, 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 other than asking Americans over and over again, hey, it's up to you, um, you know, that you're America and you need to get in touch with, with Congress and now Congress needs to listen to you. All right, well, America voted for President Obama in 2008, knowing this was on his agenda. America voted in 2010, uh, voted in a lot, a lot of Tea Party people and Republicans to take the House back, but not the Senate. And then, and then after the law, and, and the laws in place at that point. And then in 2012, Americans voted for President Obama again. So, um, despite the fact that that uh, Governor Romney said, "Hey, I'll repeal it by executive order on day one," so. So I, I would I would ask Senator Cruz and anyone else, what now? You, you're asking you're, you're asking Americans to to do what to to vote for 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 more people that 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 would want to repeal the law in 2014. Is that your end game? I, I didn't get the end game from the speech. Is my point, Tony? I think that the the end is yet to be determined. And part of the process, I, I believe anyways, that he, he's trying to facilitate is the education process. Nancy Pelosi was famous for saying, you know, wait till the American people find out what's in the act. Uh, people still, you talk to the average man or woman on the street, they still don't understand what Obamacare is. Uh, they've heard all these great talking points about uh, you know, helping people who uh, couldn't get insurance before and, and that we're going to be able to keep our own insurance. But one thing that Senator Cruz did accomplish, I believe anyway, through the 21-hour speech is he raised an incredible amount of attention to the arguments against Obamacare. And all over the news, all over the media, the mainstream media, uh, liberal media, conservative media, all you heard about for a couple days was uh, Senator Ted Cruz and his arguments and logic to uh, defund Obamacare. And I believe what you're seeing now is you're actually seeing, as it's becoming implemented, more and more Americans are uh, figuring out what this is all about and more and more are against it. Wouldn't you think that that's actually one thing that was accomplished? Um, maybe. I, anytime somebody gets their 15 minutes of fame or 21 hours in this case, um, it, a month from now, will it have made a difference? I don't know. Um, what, what he's asking, Tony, and I, and I think we should cover this in, in a little more detail for the viewers of the show. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he started this movement to have the House Republicans in the House, not the Senate, in the House where there's a majority of Republicans to pass a budget that that tries to defund Obamacare, even though that's a really tricky thing because the way the law is written, they can't totally defund it unless the law is repealed, which isn't going to happen. So, um, so, so the House goes ahead and passes this budget that that eliminates some of the Obamacare spending anyway, and then it goes to the Senate, and the twenty-one hours was a was delay was designed to delay just letting it go to a vote right away, which. The Senate, of course, isn't going to pass that budget. They're going to they're going to pass a different one that doesn't defund anything for Obamacare. And now, at this point, it goes back to the House, right? So, if the House goes right back to square one and says, "Nope, we're sticking with our budget," that's how we loom towards the possible government shutdown. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of people. So, this awareness that you're talking about that he's raising, the way it's going to be spun in much of the mainstream media, and certainly by White House and congressional uh, Democrat leaders, and even some in the GOP, but not to name names, John McCain, are going to spin this. Well, this is what you wanted all along. You wanted a government shutdown over the, the Obamacare debate, and you got it. Congratulations. And I think Republicans, moderate, Tea Party, wherever they fall, will take the blame for the shutdown if it, if it actually comes to that. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's going to re be remain to be seen. I uh, don't exactly know uh, specifically, you know, what's going to happen as a result, but we're going to talk about the, uh, the shutdown more in a little bit here. Sam, I wanted to play a couple uh, different letters 
that were written to uh, Senator Cruz, and that'll give us a backdrop of just a little better example of what Americans are thinking about this particular bill. And then we'll come back and we will talk about uh, the shutdown and the implications of the shutdown and who uh, particular could or would be blamed for this, whether it's gonna be the Republicans, the Democrats, or uh, President Obama, or whoever. So we're gonna uh, play uh, some letters that were read uh, right about now. I said at the outset, the reason Congress is held in such disrepute, so little approval, is because for many years now, elected officials in both parties have refused to listen to the people. And there's a sense of despair that no matter what the American people say, our elected officials won't listen because they're more interested in themselves, they're more interested in getting an exemption for members of Congress from Obamacare than they are in fixing the problem for the American people. And that level of disillusion is not irrational. It's based on a very real problem. And yet I'm inspired that if and when the American people stand up and make our voices heard that, the, that, that our politicians will have no choice but listen. You know, I remember early on, Madam President, you and I are relatively new in this body. We've been here nine months. I remember early on, standing at this very desk along with my friend Senator Rand Paul in his historic 13-hour filibuster on drones. And I remember when Senator Paul began that filibuster, many members of this body viewed what he was doing as curious, if not quixotic, as a strange issue that, that most members of this body, frankly, were not concerned about. And we saw something incredible happen during that time, which is the American people got engaged, got involved, began speaking out, and it transformed the debate as a result of the American people's involvement, it transformed the debate. If you want Washington to listen, the only way that will happen is if it comes from the American people. So let me read some letters from the American people who don't have the opportunity to come to the Senate floor, and so I hope in a very small way to provide a voice for them. A small business from Alice, Texas wrote on August 9, 2013, we, the undersigned employees, are growing increasingly concerned with the apparent disregard for small businesses in the middle class that is on display by the United States government. We're trying to figure out how we're going to cope with the 14% increase in health insurance premiums we're facing, despite the fact that we have a lower average employee age and loss ratio than we have had at any point in our 21-year history. The increase is because of insurance companies preparing for new taxes and unreasonable requirements within Obamacare. On top of struggling to find the means to cover our own group of employees, our government now makes it clear that part of the massive amount of taxes we pay a year will use to cover 75% of health insurance costs for members of Congress and their staffers. As waivers are granted daily, shielding big business, unions, government agencies, and various other Affordable Care Act supporters, it is clear the burden will rest firmly on middle class small businesses like us. We strongly encourage our elected officials to place a higher importance on public service than self-service. And President, let me read that sentence again. We strongly encourage our elected officials to place a higher importance on public service than self-service. We are hurting badly because of this, as are many disillusioned businesses with whom we communicate in our industry. Headlines nationally report hiring freezes and layoffs due to increased costs on businesses large and small. The weight is too heavy at the worst time, and in results, the economy will soon break. 
We urge Congress to defund or repeal the Affordable Care Act with no further delay. Now, Madam President, that's not me speaking. That is from a small business in Alice, Texas, and I would note that's not even the CEO speaking. That is a letter signed by the employees of that small business because they are hurting. But let me note, it's not limited to the state of Texas. I guarantee you there are people hurting in every one of the 50 states, every one of the states we represent. A commercial real estate broker from Chesapeake City, Virginia, wrote on September 20th, 2013. I want to share with you how Obamacare is affecting my business. I'm a commercial real estate broker in Virginia and I'm already feeling the effects of this disastrous bill. I am currently in the process of analyzing an apartment portfolio for sale by a client, for a client, and recently the occupancy has dropped dramatically in this class C low income community. The community is not subsidized as these tenants are paying out of pocket for rent. Most of the tenants work in fast food, janitorial, and low paying service related jobs. A great deal of them had their hours cut to 29.5 hours per week and cannot pay the rent. Our occupancy has dropped as well as the income. Our management company has reached into the city of Richmond for rent assistance for these tenants, but to no avail. Not only are these people going to be forced into government housing, but my client will realize a smaller equity harvest. This is a disaster, and it affects everyone. As you can see by this scenario, many are affected by this bill. Also, a Class A franchisee with a national restaurant chain whom I represent is experiencing the pain from this bill. They are being forced to sell off to a larger franchisee because they cannot afford to comply with the requirements. I wish the American people understood how severely the economy will be impacted. Thank you for fighting the good fight. We are behind you. So those are some... Madam uh, President, oops, I rise today. Those are some letters that were read uh, by constituents, by Americans, a, and... In uh, opposition to Obamacare. Oops. I rise today... All right. Technical difficulties. So, yeah, that was uh, letters that U.S. Senator Ted Cruz wrote, uh, people that wrote him, that he read on the U.S. Senate floor. I believe a uh, pretty powerful uh, testimony um, about the doubts and the insecurities that people have surrounding this law. One of the main ones that stuck out to me were the uh, low-wage employees, the people that work for uh, fast food restaurants, for uh, different delivery companies, um, that their hours are being cut from 40 to 29, specifically because of this law and the incentives that are placed on employers to cut people down to part-time jobs so they don't have to um, basically comply with uh, the bill. And to me, that's a, a pretty alarming trend that's happening across the country uh, because a lot of families, working class families, they need to work 40 plus hours a week. 29 hours a week simply isn't enough to pay the rent, to pay the bills. And it's something that we all need to think about when uh, considering whether we want to go forward with this bill. But, you know, it might be all uh, for nothing because as Sam has, has pointed out over and over again that this is the law of the land, uh, that the Democrats do have the majority in the U.S. Senate, and President Obama is not going to sign a bill that defunds Obamacare. Isn't that right, Sam? Yeah, and, and Tony, I wanted to... Sorry, I heard a little feedback there for a second, but I actually... During the video, I did a quick fact check, Tony Hernandez show fact check. Thank you. On myself, because um, <laughs> because I said some things about Obamacare, and I wanted to make sure that's true. I'm citing a CBS News report, so take that for what you will. But um, even if a shutdown happens, mm -hmm. um, chances this is how 
this is how my this is my opinion. This is how little uh, the defund Obamacare uh, initiative will will do. Um, even if a shutdown takes place, the exchanges are still going to start up on October first. The government has a number of other sources for for funding to draw from to keep the exchanges running. So even if you defund it, the exchanges go online. What have you accomplished? Um, a large portion of the fund is a large portion of the law, I should say, is funded with mandatory spending. So things like the military and um, the the post office, things that run even during a government shutdown. It sounds like to me, from what I've been able to read and research, that Obamacare, because of the way the law was written, is right up there with the military. It'll it's mandatory that it keeps running. Um, so they have a lot of revenue streams. Basically, the defund movement is only going to defund additional discretionary spending for Obamacare. So, um, so I think that the Republicans need to come to terms with this. That the end game right now, I, I, I still would like to know what, what is it? Where are you going with this? Even if you get this immediate defund of discretionary spending. So, um, now Tony, that all of that being said, I want to be really clear as, that I think Obamacare. Is, is a train wreck, uh, like I think you do, like certainly some of the other guests that, that appear regular, uh, regularly on your show do. So I was reading a column this week, and it was really good. The author <laughs> made a, you know, a really extreme analogy, but those are sometimes the best ones, even if they're a little bit ridiculous. And it said, trying to defund Obamacare or overturn the law right now when you don't have a Republican president and majorities in both houses would be kind of like fighting the war in the Pacific in World War II and attacking Japanese mainland on day one rather than having the battle in Midway and those other Pacific Island battles. <laughs> you don't go attack, you know, Honshu on day one. Um, and, and, and there are really good examples out there for where the Republicans could do themselves a lot of good. And um, I wanted to talk about one really briefly because I don't know how well the viewers know about this because the Republicans keep things like 21-hour filibusters in the news rather than focusing on some of the things that President Obama has been up to lately. And one of which is the, the hypocrisy behind uh, this gold-plated medical plan that all of Congress and their staffers will now keep. And Senator Cruz, to his credit, did talk about that uh, several times in, in the filibuster. But because of this federal employee's benefits program that's fair pay for, for everyone in Congress and their staffers to have this wonderful plan. And uh, like you alluded to earlier, Nancy Pelosi and, and the let's pass the bill and find out what's in it. So in their infinite wisdom, they didn't realize that when they said, oh yeah, this is going to be great for everyone. Of course we have to go on it by law. Well now, I mean, they were so short-sighted, they didn't even do the math to figure out that that themselves and their staffers will pay several thousand dollars more per year to keep their benefits. President Obama gave them an exemption. This was about a month ago. And as some of your other guests do, I would like to quote the Federalist Papers for a second, if I may. This is from James Madison, number 57. They, and he's referring to Congress, can make no law which will not have its full operation on themselves and their friends, as well as on the great mass of the society. Uh, what he's saying is you can't have laws that are good for Congress and then shove everyone else with something else. Um, that's exactly what they did. It's, it's illegal by their own law, and yet Republicans haven't dared to challenge it. Uh, second, delay the individual mandate. How would the Democrats possibly defend that President Obama delayed the mandate a year for businesses, but the rest of us, we have to sign up and pay? That's illegal. Uh, it's an excellent little, point. You know, these little things, Tony, that you could, you could highlight, the Democrats would hate to have to defend why they're taking this lucrative benefit on our dime. But we don't get. <laughs> Attack that. Say we're not going to fund the government this year unless you sign up for the exchange that you passed. It's not Republican care. It's Obamacare. You pass this, sign up for it. I just think that's a that's an outcome that you could demand and actually force them to answer questions. Whereas right now they're just they just get to say, oh, the Republicans want to shut down the government. 
That's a that's a pretty good point that you're you're making there, and I, I want to challenge you, Sam, one step further. Is, is why why don't people listen to your logic here? Why do we have what we have going on in the Congress right now? Why do you think that is? I'll you think you, exactly it, you think it's because the, the Republicans aren't aren't so smart? I'll tell you exactly. Well, first of all, I, I don't think uh, anyone in Congress is all that brilliant, but. Um, I think individually there are a lot of smart people in, in the House and the Senate, but that collectively they just don't work very well together. And here's an example. So the, so the Tea Party people are very principled, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. But it's that analogy about the war in the Pacific. They, they want to attack the Japanese mainland rather than start with the Battle of Midway. That's, that's how I kind of view it. They're saying no. Um, delaying the individual mandate for a year is not good enough or uh, forcing Congress to go on the plan. That's not good enough. We need to defund and uh, repeal the whole thing. Uh, and, and they won't be satisfied until they get exactly what they want. The Democrats are the same. The, the far lefties are the same, Tony. They, they're, they, they don't want to cave to anything that the law allows. And they even blatantly break the law now and make different business, different rules for big business versus the individual or Congress versus the individual. But they're smarter about taking a unified approach and it's easier to defend when it is the law. Since the Republicans can't come together and say, hey, let's attack this piece by piece and, and, and at least buy us a year's time with a delay of the individual mandate, that's why we're where we are because we have some very principled people that want the whole thing gone, and it's either all or nothing. That's my opinion. So in your opinion then, Sam, why is it that Democrats are, they can so much easier unify behind these specific issues, whereas on the Republican side you see various fractures between uh, the establishment, the Tea Partiers, the Ron Paulers, the Libertarians. Why do you think that it, that it is? Well, the Democrats have done a much better job over this. We're getting into a pretty um, lengthy conversation, but the Democrats have done a much better job over 40 or 50 years of getting people onto entitlements. Obamacare is the next big one, unfortunately. And then those people are under the impression that they are just stuck voting Democrat. And whereas conservatives that want less or as little as possible government, they have no problem telling the GOP, the, the Republican establishment, essentially to shove it and, and we'll do what we want because they're not the ones that are collecting these hefty entitlements. Whereas the Democrats, I think, I hate to use the word good, but have done a good job of almost dividing, isolating. I don't think, I don't buy into anything the Democrats say about how they unify us. I think they like differences, whether it's gender, race, whatever, and they like people feeling isolated or as a minority that must vote Democrat. Um, even, you know, environmentalists. Um, there are groups that just for whatever reason feel like they must vote Democrat and the Republicans don't have that because they generally want less government. There's a, there's a lot of truth to what you're saying here. And bringing this back to Minnesota, uh, you can see how Minnesota Democrats the vast majority of them campaign, and uh, this might be good advice for uh, the candidate, uh, Michelle Mankey, who was here earlier, but a lot of these establishment Democrats, the way that they campaign and the, the way that they message and their television commercials and everything are strictly anti-Republican messaging. You know, yes. don't vote for Republicans because they'll take away your freedom to, to marry. Don't vote for Republicans because they want to infringe on your rights to vote. Or don't vote Republican because they're just a bunch of far-right uh, lunatics who want to shut the government down. And so I think what you're alluding to is that the people who are uh, voting or feel uh, obligated to the Democratic side are more or less voting on an anti-Republican ticket. Do you think that's mm -hmm. true? And what can Republicans yeah, do to fix that? So, Tony, I think I have a really good idea. Um, what would, if you had to name one issue, one social issue 
in the past calendar year where President Obama and the Democrats have consistently lost, what would it be? The social issue that they've consistently lost? It's been in the news a lot. It's in the news for two, three days at a time, and then it goes away because the Democrats always lose. I'll give you a clue. Newtown. Uh, gun control. Gun control. They always lose. Um, remember President Obama in the wake of Newtown saying, we have polls that say 90% of Americans now want stricter gun control laws. It's time to act. Now, that poll's a bunch of garbage because, of course, after, some, after a tragedy, a lot of people are going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. We should have something stricter. But let's just say he's right, that 90% of people wanted stricter gun control laws right then and there. Well, then why are so many Democrats in red-ish or purplish states not voting for what the president wants. And I think uh, it's because the NRA does such, like them or hate them, does, is the most effective lobby in the, in the country. They, they take one day, which their, their stance is we mourn the tragedy, and the next day it's just, it's mailings, it's bombarding the, the, the congressional offices, and it's, um, they, they almost give these politicians a taste of their own medicine. Hey, you vote for this, we will make sure that every last gun owner in your uh, in your district knows it. You will pay the price. I think that the Republicans need to have a conversation with the NRA and say, how do we get the message out to everyone's constituents, not just ours in really red parts of the country, but you know, on the fence areas about just how damaging Obamacare will be to you and your family. Because if we if, if it's left just up to Congress, Tony, they, they don't accomplish anything. I mean, it's impressive that he spoke for 21 hours, but now what? Are you gonna Are you gonna make sure that those stories you read about businesses and families and how people are impacted? You're gonna make sure all the people that don't watch C-SPAN, which is 99% of America, get that information? Because I think that's what the NRA does, and that's why gun control legislation efforts always fail. So there needs to be more of an offensive on the Republican part to get the information on how destructive. I know it because I've seen my premiums rise. I'm not sure everyone does. Uh, certainly people that choose not to buy insurance when they're forced to are going to realize it, but I don't think the Republicans have, got, have done a good enough job, and maybe it's because they don't have a private lobby like the NRA except for an anti-Obamacare mm -hmm. <laughs> stance. Well, you, you Sounds like, it reminds me of something that President Reagan, I believe, said. He said the, the best way to get rid of a bad law is to enforce it. And that might be actually what ultimately ends Obamacare is when it is begun to be implemented and people feel the pain, people see the jobs leaving, uh, people get cut to part-time hours. Uh, that may be the number one force that actually ultimately causes the American people to rise and to elect uh, new leaders into Congress. What do you think about that? I think so, because ultimately you have to win elections. But uh, to your first comment, that, that, that you can read a lot of pundits. That's what they're saying. Let it collapse under its own weight. Um, that it's such a disaster. And whether it's the data privacy breaches, the cost, um, I, I would really... If I were the Republicans, I'd go back to the fact that I would really hammer home, hey, we're not going to pass a budget unless all of Congress abides by this law that they said they would do in 2010 because we were sold on how cheap it would be. And the premiums would drop for everyone because of this. So I would, I would let it go into law, let them own it. Not yeah. a single Republican voted for it. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's probably what's going to occur here is the law is going to be implemented and people are going to ultimately discover whether they like it or whether they not and that's when we're going to finally see real change here and sam we're at the end of our hour here i'd like to thank everybody for tuning in thank our special guest michelle Mankey, who's running for the minnesota state house of representatives uh, thank sam wayne pierce for coming on the show and thank you for tuning in may god bless you may god bless america and via con dios